On Larry King now, the brilliant Neil deGrasse Tyson. We were with Neil deGrasse Tyson, one of my all-time favorite guests. Wait a minute, you've had 60,000 guests. This is yeah, but you're one of my favorite because you're so bright and you're fun. Well, thank you. I'm yeah. honored. You're in the you've universe. I was going to say time. in the world, but you're in the universe. We're all in the universe. Those who deny climate change, what do you say to them? I don't, I don't care what you believe. You believe whatever you want. The problem comes about is if you are in denial of an emergent scientific truth and you wield power over legislation. That's a recipe for disaster. Plus, where's the wire? <laughs> you don't know the answer to that. You're an astrophysicist. This is the biochemical derivation of the electrophysical magnitude. I'm not, I'm, why do we keep booking guests like this? All next on Larry King Now. Welcome to Larry King Now. We're in a beautiful hotel, the Trump International. We're in New York City on a spring day. I grew up here. There's nothing like spring in New York overlooking the park. And our special guest is Neil deGrasse Tyson. He is one of my all-time favorite guests. He is a Renaissance man, astrophysicist, cosmologist, science commentator, TV host, head of the Hayden Planetarium here in New York, where we went as kids. They used to tie us with ropes and we walk along. And the person perhaps most responsible for invigorating public interest in science, Neil's longtime radio program, Star Talk, is now also a TV series. It airs Mondays on National Geographic, which is very appropriate. We'll talk more about that later. It's good to see you, Neil. Thanks for having me back. And Hi. your Twitter count is now 3.5 million. You have jumped 2 million since last we met. Yeah, it's, I, it's, I, I don't know who's, I don't know, I don't understand it, really. <laughs> I want to remind people I'm an astrophysicist. They can still pull out. Uh, but it's I, when I wake up and see those numbers, it's... For me, it's evidence that there is an underserved appetite that people have for thinking about the universe. And I'm happy and privileged to be in that role, but I'm, I'm delightfully surprised every time I see those numbers rise. I grew up with a bunch of guys in Brooklyn. Not one to my memory said, you know what? I want to be an astrophysicist. <laughs> okay. And we'd have said, what are you nuts, Bernie? <laughs> well, I, you know, it was my first visit to the Hayden Planetarium, where I now serve as director. How old were you? I was nine. Nine years old, a family visit. As a family, we, you know, we went to all the, yeah. all the places in the city. We went to the zoo, you know, the art museum. And, and I think my parents were just, it, it was a matter of exposure for my brother, my sister, and me. And you don't want your options to be limited when you're asked what do you want to, what do you want to be when you grow up. And the more things you see as a child, the more options you have to reach for if something piques your interest. And for me, a first visit to the planetarium, I've, I'm convinced, in fact, that it was the universe that chose me. Then you have to be good at something in school, which I gather was math. Well, so ma I liked math, but I, I think it, it's wrong to say you have to be good at it. I'd rather say you have to want to be good at it. And then ambition kicks in. And ambition can override whether or not your first foray was unpleasant or you didn't do well or maybe you flunked an exam, but if you really like it, you will spend time learning it. That's, sure. how, that's what liking something means. Maybe too many of us believe that we like something because you're good at it. And sure, there are plenty of cases where that's so, but why deny yourself the pleasure of a life of pursuit of something that brings pleasure? I love the microphone. I love the radio. It's all I ever wanted to do. Is this even a real microphone? Yeah, yeah it is. It's not hooked up, but it's a real mic. It's a real mic. <laughs> Where's the wire? <laughs> you don't know the answer to that. Hey, you're an astrophysicist. This is the biochemical derivation of the electrophysical magnitude. I'm not, I'm, why do we keep Look, booking guests like this? You, you, you've been doing this so long, they've like uh, neurochem neurochemically attached it to your brain, right? That's how they got you going here. <laughs> Well, did you ever get discouraged along the way? Did you ever fail a test and say, oh? Yeah, I mean, I remember, uh, discourage, I don't know if discourage is the right word. I remember opening a calculus book for the first time. Good luck. In high school. And calculus is not some natural next step after algebra, right? It's a completely different new way of thinking about 
the relationships of things that change in the world. And you open up the book and there are all these squiggly lines and all these alphabet drawn from Greek letters. And it's like, I will never understand this, ever. Should I bail now while I have the chance? And I said, let me, let me just try this. And a month later after, I said, hey, I kind of understand, I think I know what that is. Oh, two months later, hey. Three months later, I got this. And, and that was, that, that, that moment for the rest of my life was it, was, it became proxy for me saying, if at first encounter, I have no clue what's going on, just spend time learning it. I mean, it sounds simple, but, but you can, it, it, I would realize how profound that fact, how profoundly that would affect the rest of my life. Anytime I saw something I didn't understand, work at it. Do you use calculus? All the time. There is no understanding of the physical universe without calculus. Were you a nerd? I was, yeah, I was, yes, card carrying. I attended the Bronx High School of Science. Oh my God. Okay, and this is pre- I had to take a test to get into that. Pre, yeah, you did. No, you not only take the test, you had to like get above a score to get in, right? Not just taking the, anybody take the test, <laughs> you gotta get above the score. But I, I was, that's how old I am. They, they make fun of you for being old, that's how old I am. I was there and we formally learned calculations on a slide rule. And my slide rule had a leather pouch. And you go walking down, you know, <laughs> the, the best nerds had like the biggest slide rule pouch. And you know, it's almost like what? Did your friends in the- walk down the hallway. Your friends in the hood make fun of you? A little bit. A little bit, the, because the hood that I was in was not sort of the stereotyped hood that people imagined. Uh, my earliest memories are the East Bronx and the housing projects there, the Castle Hill middle income housing projects. But then my father's income went above that level and they, they, they kick you out when that happens. And so we moved and we moved to Riverdale. Oh. Uh -huh. That's what I'm saying, that's what I'm saying, Riverdale. That's uptown Bronx. Yeah, yeah, that's, that's uptown. That's, so in the Bronx, there wasn't so much of the force of the hood that you might think. But nonetheless, there were pres pressures for me to be athletic for, yeah. and no one really cared about what I was doing, but I cared about what I was doing. Coming up, we'll talk about the mission to Mars, privatization of space. We'll talk about climate change. We'll be right back. We're with Neil deGrasse Tyson, one of my all-time favorite guests. Okay, let's get to some things current. Wait a minute, you've had 60,000 guests. Yeah, but you're one of my favorite because you're so bright and you're fun. Well, thank you. I'm yeah. honored. By you're in the universe. I was going to say time. in the world, but you're in the universe. We're all in the universe. There's 80 billion stars. More, but uh, we'll, okay. we'll start with that. How, how <laughs> could anybody anybody know that there's a heaven, that they're going somewhere, that uh, there's an afterlife? How could anyone know that? No, they that can boggles my mind. They can believe. They know. Well, but belief is, I could believe that it's raining, well, but it right. ain't. Well, this is the difference between believing something and using the methods and tools of science to establish what is objectively true. And what is objectively true is something that is true outside of your belief system. That's what science is. That's how we can make stuff. Do you wonder how it all began? Oh, of course. Of what course. do you think? Well, so it depends what you mean by it all. There was a day. It all, this. Well, no, I'm saying there was a day. It all could be how did life get here? How did the earth get here? How did the sun, moon, yeah. solar system get here? How did the galaxy get here? How did the universe get here? And so all of our evidence points to a, a pretty fun beginning of the universe, the Big Bang. We got a term for it, the Big Bang. What was there before it? It's a frontier of our investigation. We, I got top people working on it. <laughs> to find out what was there before. Yeah, yeah, we don't know. What we don't was know. there before the before? Yeah, we're, we're not ready to put our top people on that one yet. Uh, so the problem of origins is a very different kind of investigation from just describing just the existence of a thing. And there are many cups here, and so we can say, oh, this came out of a factory. But the, what made the factory? Well, people made the factory. Then what made the people? You keep going back, and then you have the sort of the origins question, because the, typically there's only one origin of anything, so you can't compare it right. to other things. And so it's, it, it poses special challenges to Is scientific Is that why inquiry. many of you guys go nuts? No! <laughs> 
No, just the ones you've interviewed. <laughs> you've selected them. You gotta go crazy with being thin. All right, why isn't it raining in California? Yeah, you know, uh, the climate is, I mean, drought, it's, not like, it's not as though droughts have no precedent in the history of the world. Uh, but what's more important than that it's not raining is there, you know, there's a consumption of clean water, potable water from the water table that's not being replenished and it's being pulled out at a faster rate than it's returning. And that's a recipe for disaster. And so, so we need to think more sort of, dare I use the word, holistically about systems that, that, that manifest on this earth. And, and, and that's a relatively new way to think about the world. But what do we do about it? Stumped, huh? Yeah, I don't, I don't have easy answers. I think we need to be better shepherds of our activities and our behaviors. If you're watering lawn, your lawn, do you need clean, potable water to water your lawn? No. You could use the water that came out of your dishwasher. Your, your grass is not going to care. But we've set up a system that does not intelligently use even the limited water that's available. Bigger question, why isn't it raining? All I can tell you is that in the world, what we're going to find is more extremes of weather. Okay, when it rains, it's going to rain heavier. When it's not going to rain, it's going to rain less than it ever didn't rain before. And as these extremes, we have to, that's kind of the new normal we're going to have to grow accustomed to. And all evidence points to the fact that it is human-caused influence on the ecosystem. On the, on the climactic system. So cold weather will get colder, warm weather will get warmer, wet weather will get wetter. Yeah, yeah. So the extremes, you'll start visiting the extremes. And what happens is, as, as, the, as the temperature rises, you, more moisture from the ocean gets lifted into the atmosphere. And generally, when we think of weather, we think of storms and things. And so now that when you have a storm, there's more moisture to feed that storm. There's more heating to drive the convective cells. And so the storm gets more ferocious. And, and, you know, we had flooding down here in New York. By the way, this change that people are talking about, it's not one day the ocean will just sort of come in and stay there on your doorstep. No, that's not how it happens first. It happens first where there would be a storm where there'd be a tide surge. And previously, the tide surge never really, you know, maybe came over the sidewalk or the boardwalk, but that was about it. It went away. Now the tide sur surge makes it into the streets. And that's your first indication. These extremes are, th are your first encounter with what will soon be become the new normal. Those who deny climate change, what do you say to them? Uh, the, I, in a free country, which at least we believe, we, we tell ourselves we live in a free country, uh, I, don't, I don't care what you believe. You believe whatever you want. The problem comes about is if you are in denial of an emergent scientific truth and you wield power over legislation, that's a recipe for disaster. The person on the street doesn't care about climate change or doesn't, you know, maybe I'll, we'll have a conversation, but I'm not going to lose sleep over that. It's when someone, an elected official, stands in denial of climate change, something that scientists have been telling them now for decades, and they're going to create legislation in response to that. What, that is the end of an informed democracy. The end. I love when they say, I don't know anything about it, but... But it's not true. <laughs> I don't know yeah. anything, but yeah. it's not and, true. And so, by the way, I don't beat politicians over the head. You'll never see me arguing with a politician. You know why? Because politicians, representatives, senators, they are duly elected by a community of people, the electorate. So if they want to say the Earth is 6,000 years old, it's probably because their electorate thinks so. And so as an educator, my task is to educate the electorate so that they could then vote people into office who can make sensible legislative decisions that can affect us all and not derive from their personal private belief system. The man who brought us Cosmos has another show on the air. It's called Star Talk, and we'll talk about that and the rumored second season of Cosmos after the break. We're back with Mr. Tyson. What is Star Talk? Uh, Star Talk, thank, thanks for asking. It's a, it was an experiment radio show five years ago on a grant from the National Science Foundation. And I looked around and I saw 
Well, how does someone receive science through media? And there's some fine science programming uh, on NPR, especially where die. where there's a you know Science Friday, for example, where and I've been on Science Friday, I love it to death. There's a journalist interviewing a scientist, but if you tune into that, chances are you know you already like science. That's why you'd listen to it. But how about the people who don't know they like science? Or how about the people who know they don't like science? How do you get science to them? So I thought, why don't we invert the model? And I'll be the interviewer, I'm the scientist, and my guests will hardly ever be scientists. I would draw them, I would, I would, they would be hewn from pop culture. And, and my conversation with them would be about all the ways science has influenced their life or their livelihood. Are you teaching or asking? Um, so no, so there's some teaching in there, but it's really, uh, if these are people, you would have heard of these people we've interviewed. One of them is like President Carter, all right? I didn't ask him about the Middle East. That's what other people do. I asked him about his engineering background and how that might have influenced his, his, uh, you know, his diplomacy. Is he thinking differently from others who had a different background? That's kind of interesting to me. It might be interesting to others. Um, interview George Takei from uh, the original star. He's a fun guy uh, yeah. on every level. And we talked about the, 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 the science fiction projections for the future and what came true, what didn't. But he's from pop culture. He's not a scientist. Uh, he may have played one on TV, but he's not a scientist. So you do this on television now too? So uh, now it jumps species and uh, the National Geographic Channel. By the way, Cosmos, while it aired on Fox domestically and National Geographic delayed, National Geographic took it around the world in 180 countries. And so I had a relationship with National Geographic and they said at the end of Cosmos, we got to do more TV together. And I said, no, that's not kind of what I'm about, but I am doing this radio show. Maybe we could film that. They agreed and now it's on late night, like 11 p.m. And the great man who started Cosmos was- Carl Sagan. My man, I interviewed him maybe a hundred times. Yeah, oh, Carl's a billion. So you, you can say you've interviewed him maybe a billion times. <laughs> <laughs> I, I, I loved him. Was, yeah, get the billion he was, going he, there. He was for you. Yeah, he, uh, I, my first encounter with him was, was memorable for me. Probably not for him, but for me. <laughs> I had applied to college. And I've told this story before. It's, in fact, we, we, I retell it in Cosmos. I'd applied to college and I'd known I was interested in the universe. I had been accepted at Cornell and the unknown to me, the admissions office forwarded my application to him for his comment and reaction. He then sent me a personal letter, hand signed saying, I hear you're considering Cornell. I'll be happy to give you a tour of the campus if you wanna come up and visit to help you decide. And he was already famous. He had been on Carson and scientist on Johnny Carson, oh my gosh, that was, that, that was nobody had done that before. So he had, he had cleared the field for anyone who would come after him to do much of what he uh, had pioneered. And so I did go up, he met me outside the building, gave me a tour, reached behind him, didn't even look, reached behind him, pulled out one of his own books. <laughs> I just will never forget that. You have written so many books, you just reach behind and grab the book that happens to be there. Signed it to me, I still have that book. So I said to myself at the time, if I am ever in a position to bring the universe down to earth in the ways he has, then I will for sure be looking to students and others coming up with well, the dignity and respect that he- Cornell's not a famous them. school of science. No, they, they do, they, they well, Hotel it, was, management. it was an ag school and uh, th there's a huge ag, agricultural dimension to it. Uh, when I visit, I love the, the, the barn. The barn, they take the, the methane flatulence that cows so freely <laughs> put into the air from their own digestive tract. And then they use that to keep the barns warm by burning the methane over the winter. So it's, a, it's, a, it's, it's Did great. Did you enjoy Cornell? No, I didn't actually attend Cornell. You didn't? Yeah, yeah, no, I actually didn't attend. I, Where'd you go? I, I attended Harvard. Oh, wow. Yeah. No, no, because it was, I figured if I, I didn't want to go to Cornell just for one person, because suppose he went to another place, or, whereas uh, Harvard was very deep in astrophysics. Was Carl disappointed? He wrote me a letter. He said I was, uh, uh, he said I did not make a mistake by choosing Harvard. That was the... Now, what do you make of Mr. Musk and the others who are, what, they're going to... Oh, Elon! Send, they're going to send their own planes up. Uh, you know, it's rockets, yeah. Um, <clears throat> I'm skeptical on a couple of levels. By the way, we need people thinking that way. 
He wants to send a mission to Mars. We need those people in society. Otherwise, the rest of us think that every other day should be like the previous one. So let me just lead with that. Uh, but I can tell you that the first people to do really expensive things where there's the dangerous and people could die and there's no known return on investment, those are not business people. Those are governments. The first Europeans to the New World were not the Dutch East India Trading Company. It was Columbus, funded by Spain. Then he draws the maps, and here's the trade winds, and here's where the hostels are and the friendlies are. Here's where you find the fruit that you can eat. Then you can make a business case for it. Otherwise, it's a really short meeting. If I say, hey, I'm gonna go to Mars, bring in all your venture capitalists, and they start asking questions. How much does it cost? I don't know, but a lot. And is it dangerous? Yeah, people probably die. What's my return on investment? I have no idea, probably zero. That's a five minute meeting and it doesn't happen. So you have to, somebody's gotta go out there with the long view, the longer than the quarterly report view. And once the patents are awarded and you've established what's dangerous and what's safe, then you make the business case. My guest is the fabulous Neil Tyson. When we come back, I'm gonna talk about life and death and what he thinks what he believes, what he has faith in after this. We're back with Neil deGrasse Tyson. He is one of the fabulous people in this country, one of my favorite guests. I'd like to do, I'd like to tour with you. Just, we do universities and I ask questions and we explore things. Okay, you're the scientist. Bring it on, bring it on. You, you get on. You've accept facts. Facts and belief, I know the religious people believe, the scientist has proved. What do you believe? What do you think happens when we die? Well, so I, I, I can make some unassailable statements about what happens when you die. So you spend your life eating food. Food has a calorie content and calorie is a source of energy. Calorie is a unit of energy. You bring it in and then the energy is available for you to maintain your body temperature at nearly 100 degrees, it's 98.6. How do you keep something at 100 degrees when nothing else around you is? You're burning energy to sustain that because biologically we need to be at that temperature to function, okay? You also need energy to walk and to move. That's why you eat food. The moment you die, what happens? You don't maintain the energy. Your temperature drops. How far does it drop? To room temperature. At a funeral in the casket, if you touch the hand of the person in the casket, your first thought is, the body's cold. No, it's not, it's room temperature. But it's cold compared to 100 degrees. They're no longer burning this energy. Okay, so now, every one of your molecules has energy within it. If you get cremated, that energy gets released in the form of heat and you heat the air, and that air radiates to space. You get buried, which is how I wanna, my body to be disposed of, bury me. Bury me, because you know why? I don't want the energy content of my body to just get radiated out into space of no use to anybody. Put me in the ground. Let the worms, microbes, come in and out of my body. And the energy content of my body that I had assembled over my lifetime, consuming the flora and fauna of this earth, my body then returns to them. And thus is the cycle of life. I know that's gonna happen because you can measure where the energy goes. And that's how I want to go out. But you're not conscious and that's for eternity, right? Uh, yeah, that there's no evidence that I have any consciousness of anything. And by the way, is that so weird? Did you have consciousness before you were born? Were you saying, how come I'm not on earth? My gosh, I need to be on earth. Or how come, where, where am I? No, you, there's just the state of non-existence. Oh. And so I'm not given any yeah, reason. Yeah, but now I am born. Okay. And I can't stand the thought of non-existence. See, I already have existence. I don't, I accept Okay, it, it is true. We fear death because we are born knowing only life. Right. I get that. However, I, I, I t take another view because I've been asked, if you could live forever, would you? 
Yes. <laughs> okay. We're Don't done with the interview. The yes. Uh, no, okay, sure, that's an attractive idea. But the way I look at it is, it is the knowledge that I'm going to die that creates the focus that I bring to being alive. The urgency of accomplishment, the need to express love now, not later. If we live forever, why ever even get out of bed in the morning? Because you always have tomorrow. That's not the kind of life I want to lead. But why, don't you fear not being around? I fear living a life where I could have accomplished something and didn't. That's what I fear. I, I don't fear death. You don't fear the unknown. I love the unknown. I, 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 I love the, you know what I want on my tombstone? My sister has this in her, in her notes, because in case I can't tell anyone after I die. On my tombstone, a quote from Horace Mann, great educator. Be ashamed to die until you have scored some victory for humanity. That's what I want on my tombstone. But you don't fear or, or think about not being around. My great regret about. for not being around would be, it would be kind of cool to see my kids continue yeah, to don't grow. Don't you want to know that? Yeah, that'd be, I would, that'd be fun. I want to see what inventions would make life easier, what clever discoveries or innovations would arise out of the collective brain work what of, do you of my think, species. What do you think when you see religious people, when you see popes or rabbis or people who fervently believe, the Billy Grahams mm -hmm. of the world, who are sincere and wonderful people. Yeah, of course. Who actually may be delusional that they're gone somewhere. No, they're, they're, they're embedded in belief systems. And what I look at is I see all the belief systems, and when you line them up, they're not really compatible with one another. So whatever they're believing, it can't be a truth that applies to everybody because other people believe what they do with no less fervor. And so I sit back and as a person who's interested in, ob in objective truths and I say, well, it doesn't look like that's a path towards an objective truth. So let people continue to think and say what they want. But as a citizen of a country that is not founded on a on a, on, a, on a religion, it's founded with, with sort of a secular construct in a way that protects whatever religion you want to express. This is protected in the Constitution. The Constitution doesn't actually mention God. Right. R rather controversial in its day. And the, the, it doesn't mention God because they don't want legislation to tell you what God to worship. They knew this. They knew how governments can persecute people who had belief systems that didn't agree with the state. They knew this. So they created those freedoms. And so we have these freedoms. Go ahead. But if you're gonna create legislation that has to apply to everybody, and you're now gonna put your belief system into legislation, that is not a free and open democracy. And you are an amazing man. No, the universe is amazing. I'm just revealing that fact. Thanks to my guest, Neil deGrasse Tyson. Star Talk airs Mondays at 11 p.m. 10 Central on National Geographic. It's also available on Sirius XM and iTunes. And remember, you can find me on Twitter at King's Things. And I'll see you next time, I hope.